Although it is that life seems to, if you have been following what we've been talking about, that would seem as though ordinary life comes in episodic packages, packets, that seem to have, to ordinary intelligence, just glancing around, that seems to have a beginning and an end. It is not dissimilar, may I remind you, of the episodic nature of commercial television, that they seem to have a beginning and an end, but you have got to note that the station is on 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and even that which appears to be episodic, this seems to have one show, and it's over in 30 minutes, had a beginning and an end. Next week, it's right back on, and the same kind of situation is going on. It is a form of a kind of chop-chop dynamics. It's a kind of start-stop start stop start stop protocol and specifically consider that once the secondary world is established and processes have been turned into things specific they can then be made back into processes again and then turned into things specific again and turned into processes again this is I guess we could all agree those of us that may follow any of this it's an expansion on what we've been talking about because things cannot exist in the secondary world the civilized world of man in every aspect whatsoever would not exist were it not for speech, were it not for the intellect, but into the areas that would seem to affect everyday behavior and the actual ability to stay alive and to run a civilized individual life and the collective institutional life of man on this planet, the processes of life not only are talked about, but it is coeval with the talking about it, is the processes get chopped up. Processes become things specific, that is history. But now the expansion I want you to consider, you could leave it there. And I would assume that somebody here and there, if they heard that in a certain way from a certain <laughs> observation within themselves, they could take that as having some meaning and they might be able to chew on that for a long time and make some surprising observations on their own and could accept it as being a discovery of sorts. That, hey, that's true, I see what it is, and it's actually on metaphorical for those of you that think I continue to, if anybody does, to slaughter and misuse the terms of metaphor and simile and metonymy, picturization, symbolism, I'm going to have to tell you, this is actually on metaphor. It is closer to symbolism. Those of you that like to keep up with that kind of literary flim-flam stuff, things, affairs. Because the processes do have to become verbalized and they do have to become things specific and you could stop there and you could chew on that a long time and I bet a lot of you could go a lot of places with that <laughs> but that's not the end of it because almost as quickly things that have some significance to life, that energy gets, needs to be moved about, they will go from being then the thing specific, they will get rejuvenated, and they will become again processes. It is just another view, you might say, of the life's on-off switch, the inspiration and expiration, the systolic and the diastolic, the consumption and elimination, ho and hum, this and that. <laughs> because after you begin to see such fairly mundane matters as the eternal struggle between truth and fiction and good and evil and all that, if you think that you move some step beyond that and that the third possibility that you might come up with and believe that you're freed from the on and off switch is not correct. Because you can't stop there. If you stop there, you have simply pursued a dead end. You might have seen something for yourself, but if you go back and continue to try to look, you're going to mistake what is now a landfill for some sort of oasis. Because once you've seen it, what else is there to see? 
Now you can keep going back and say, well, there's more to see. Well, you got eye problems. You didn't look right the first time. Or, of course, there is another possibility, but why should we discourage those easily discouraged? Let me grab several, right at the heart of it, examples of how the primary processes must be turned into things specific for the secondary world, for the world as we know it to exist. But then, how, once they're things specific, they will get reactivated, redone, resurrected into processes again. But at least three good examples would be memory, criticism, and verbal reality. For instance, memory retrieves processes. For memory to already have anything filed away, processes have had to have been turned into things specific, as we were talking about last time, on a wider level historically, perhaps, but they have got to be made into things specific or they would not be part of, as they like to laughingly call it in the universities, be part of your retrievable memory. You could not recall anything. It would simply not be one of your memories if you were thinking about a process. The process, whatever it was, had to be turned into things specific, like your unhappy love affair, your unhappy first marriage. You, you might say something. People might be discussing marriage and the problems and travails of being someone's legal serious other, and you might say, yes, I too had an unhappy first marriage. And the, assuming it was your turn to talk and their turn to listen, the people at the bar might turn and say, well, tell us about it quickly. <laughs> but you don't leave it simply as I had an unhappy first love affair, first marriage. They have to say, they're saying, how so? In other words, they're saying, come on, come on, come on, come on, tell me the rest. Get specific. You have to say, well, we were madly in love and she was killed. Or we were madly in love, I thought, and she ran off and left me. How long were you married? It is all things specific. But what does memory do? Once things have been made, the process has made things specific so that they can be remembered. The dates, the names. Don't let anyone take this too vaguely. Everything you remember is thing specific. You do not remember processes. Now you might say it. I was trying to get you slid into it. You might say, well, I too had an unhappy first marriage. And you might say, well, it's a process I'm talking about right now. No, you're not. It is now a thing specific. You can't even think about my first marriage. Let's say you were married five years, and like everything else in life, there appeared to be peaks and valleys, ups and downs, off and ons, good times, bad times. But you do not think of it as a process. Now that it is part of memory, it is something, it is a thing specific, <coughs> an unhappy first marriage, a short-lived first marriage, a tragic first marriage, a too young first marriage. Whatever it is, it in some way is now a thing specific. Your memory at the ordinary level simply does not operate that way. You cannot take a roll of film because we are limited in the, at the ordinary level. Essentially, you've got to remember that. You people haven't forgotten that. We're not talking about anything out of the ordinary. We're talking about being within the electromagnetic spectrum and within the three dimensions of spatial space. And anything that the humans know, anybody, anything that they think about, has got to be thing specified or else you would be left with attempting to look at a movie, let us say. I don't know how long a full-length movie is, but if several thousand, surely a hundred thousand feet of film, if you could think about the process, let's say it's 50,000 feet, I don't know what it is, but a 90-minute movie, you'd have to have a screen, some kind of projector, large enough, we are not getting to your mind yet and your abilities, but they would have to understand, unroll the whole film instead of showing one frame at a time and your eye doing the rest and putting it all together, it would have to show, let's say your first marriage, from the time you got married to the time you got divorced. 
or the time it was over. That's up to you. We don't know when it's over. You'd have to decide. When, when was Napoleon actually done for? It'd be up to you. And, of course, it changes from moment to moment. But at any rate, your unhappy love of first marriage, let us say, is this 50,000 feet worth of film that has to be some sort of ejector, not seeing out one beam of light through one frame, but showing the entire, you understand, film of your marriage up there and you'll be able to conceive of it. But you realize under or any ordinary conditions is not even worth discussing. You cannot do it. You're limited literally to carry this symbolism. You're literally limited by what you can see. And of course, there are those in the city, dumb enough, I mean, intelligent enough, who would say, well, that doesn't necessarily apply to what I think, which shows how much they think. <laughs> you are limited. Things have to be made into things specific. The process of anything cannot be recalled by ordinary memory, even though it may use terms like my unhappy marriage or those 10 years of hell when I was married. But no, and you may say, well, I am, my mind, my memory is telling me that 10 years of hell. It is not. Surely you can see somewhere past the crack of this. It is not a process you're talking about. It has been made thing specific. That is the only way. There is a reasonable symbolism, if you want to put it this way, that you live this 10-year marriage. And it is a process, because being alive is a process. And so it gets to the point that it is now part of memory. Let us say that the day you finally do get a call from her attorney and says it's over, their papers are final, and you're paying X amount of money, and let us say that just like, well, that day I finally just swallowed, and I thought, well, that's it. All right, I'll do it, and you know, to hell with it. It is as though you then took an index card and literally wrote, 10 years, unhappy marriage, finished such and such date, and it's like you filed it. This is not an unfair symbolism, because you cannot go back. There's no need to. The human nervous system, the brain is not arranged that way, that in some way you can retrieve any feeling of that 10 years as a process. You may talk about it in bits and pieces. You can stand around and say, well, the first couple of years things are pretty good. And then like we went downhill, I mean, well, what it was was there for about 18 months. I was moved out of town on my job and we were separated. And so it sounds as though you're describing, but you understand you're not describing your process. Every little thing you say is some part of the process that has been made things specific. But now note, you go back and recall it and it is immediately no longer thing specific because now it is a process again. And part of the process is you retrieving the thing specific. Come on, don't get lost. You had the 10 years of marriage as a process. It's over. You've decided it's over in some way and you file the card away. It is now this 10 years of marriage. Whatever it was, it's now a thing specific. So there it is. It's now a thing specific in your memory. You're staying around and people start talking about marriage and whining and crying and you decide you'd like to play. You say, yes, I too had an unhappy marriage. You have taken the thing specific, and right already, as fast as I said it, you have made it back into now a process. Not the marriage, that's irrelevant. But the energy behind it has now been retrieved. It has come out of the card. It's like you took the card out of your file, and you said to these people, once it's your turn to talk, you said, yes, I too had an unhappy marriage. Ten years, as a matter of fact. This card has now become alive again not the marriage all oh, that's irrelevant all oh, this is just talking about it the energy behind it has now been retrieved and it has gone from being a thing specific to a process again now, it can all happen like that and it can go back faster than anybody knows faster than your eye can see the film when it's actually moving through a camera as it's supposed to you see the impression of movement where there is none you can see the impression as things go from being a processional into things specific. You can see the lack of movement where there is some. Then you can see no movement where there is some. Then you can see lack of movement when there is lack of movement. You never know because it happens like that. It goes from one to another, but it does not stay. It can be of no immediate use. That is, you can only ordinarily think of one thing at a time so you're not taking every memory you've got at any particular time or even more than one and reactivating it into any sort of processional operation. But notice just immediately as far as you can, you could go back, we were talking about grudges last time in the account books. In your memory, you can relive some process. That is, they're talking about unhappy marriages and you're staying there, it's not your turn to talk. 
and you're, you're hearing their stories, and you're thinking about, boy, that's nothing. Wait till I tell them the way she treated me, or he treated me. You have already taken the thing specific, and you have relived it in you. You drag out the account books, and maybe the party breaks up or this crowd walks away from the bar before you even get a chance to join in. But just in your, I think what some people are pleased to call their minds, that you redo really it right quick, it may only take a split second, but again, you drag out the books on your first wife, and you think, that rotten bitch, or that sorry bastard. <laughs> and so you run the process, not the full marriage, but because you've already turned it into a process again by remembering it. Do I have to say in thinking about it? As if you can remember it without thinking about it? So you've turned it back into a process, but in a split second, you can bring the process, you can bring as though you'd piece together Miss Shelley's Frankenstein again, you brought this monster and you shot the juice back to it and the son of a gun raised its head up again. <laughs> and you think, well, you, you rotten bitch, that 10 years worth of marriage. And then you look off to order another drink or whatever and it falls back down into the cart and it becomes a thing specific again. You have repackaged it. That is, it went from being a thing specific, a bad memory, and you brought it back up just to make sure, yeah, she was a bitch. Yeah, he was a sorry bastard. So you brought it to life again, then looked at it and said, yeah, I never did like it, and it falls back down, and you have simply re it, all just like that. You understand? It came from being a thing back to a process and back to a thing. As fast as neurons will work, just as fast as you heard them say, unhappy marriage, and went, <laughs> the monster rolls up, huh, and then went back down. It went, it went from being a thing specific which, of course, only came about through the intellect doing it in the secondary world of some initial process. So it had been made thingamatized, laid out, filed away, cut and dried, packaged up. But then, any time, all you got to do is think about it, and it raises back up. Yeah, maybe even rename it. You know, I thought you were a sorry bastard, but you weren't. You were a singularly sorry bastard. So, you, in a sense, you have re... Well, of course, every time you do it, in a sense, you have re-thingamatized it because you're not... It's not necessary that you absolutely do it the way you did, but you can bring back up the accounts, you know, such as just or just thinking about it. But to put it in no more de describable words, it's like bringing it back. Like, was she all that bad? <laughs> Hell yeah! Now I think about it, and I've been around. It was even worse than I thought. <laughs> and it lays back down. It becomes a thing again. It's filed back away. Take criticism in the fullest sense of the word. It can take, take past processes that have already been turned into things specific and through criticism. Individual, but I was going to start off and use a more institutionalized, in the widest sense of the word, criticism. Uh, let us say that there's a, somebody has written a definitive work, a work that is important in the secondary world called Monet, Father of Impressionism. Maybe they're, even from the book, maybe they mount some sort of show that goes across the Western world for 18 months. And it's even, they take off on the title of the book. It's some noted French or American art critic, and even the, the, the show is known as Monet, colon, the father of Impressionism. Then somebody, so it's, you understand, but I have to put it further, within that, you might also note that man's creative processes, in this case, is always turned in, the word in the Western world they use, it becomes his work. Not the process, it's his work. Now, if I grabbed an ordinary intellect and said, you see what that is? That's a well, work. You know, it means more than that. It means his total output. It means everything he's done. No, 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 they say that when I'm asking because now it's back to being a process. Now they're discussing it. But the, the critique of everything, from art to music to everything else, is the man's work. It is a product now. It has become a thing specific. Now, it may be a whole bunch of things. The show may amount to 227 of Monet's paintings. But it's still a thing specific. But at any rate, after this has become a thing specific, a well-known one, as soon as the guy wrote it, whoever was sitting around and came up with the idea of, I think I'll write a book called Monet, colon, The Father of Impressionism. All right, for that one guy right then, 
the Monet's life, his creative activity, had become thing specific. Not just that title, but it's become something thing specific to that guy, and he even sees it as being a work of his, a product. If I can get this book out and get somebody to publish it and a whole bunch of people buy it, I'll be famous. I'll be known as a man who wrote. I'll be known as a man whose work is, quote, Monet, colon, the father of Impressionism. But let us say that it expands outside this one guy's brain and that this book, as I was saying, does become well-known, is even considered definitive, even spurs a new collection and showing of Monet's work. It has become a thing specific. Do you understand? Let me continue to beat it. Just quotation marks, this title that I'm making up, Monet, the father of Impressionism. I probably didn't make it up, but at any rate, Monet, the father of Impressionism. That is not a thing specific. Monet's dead. Maybe you don't even care for his paintings. Maybe you don't know who he is. None of that matters. There is not a thing somewhere. It originally was this one guy's brain that wrote it, but now there is a thing around. If you get around hip, sophisticated, secondary world people right now and said, are you familiar with Monet, colon, the father of Impressionism? And they go, well, what'd I look like? Somebody, somebody just fell off of a turnip green binder. So it is a thing now. Monet's life. I'm not saying it amounted to anything in particular, but Monet's life, his creative output, his, the whole process of his life, of him being Monet, and of all the years that he Monated up. <laughs> He's now dead. He is a thing specific, if anybody cares to remember him. It's got his date. I mean, it'll have his name in the dictionary and then quotation marks, and it will give his birth and date. And then maybe a little blurb right quick about him. It might even say Father of Impressionism. But at any rate, the man, his life, it is all now a thing specific, or we couldn't think about him. He couldn't be in the dictionary. We couldn't have a dictionary, and so on, dot, 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 dot. But now that we have Monet, colon, the Father of Impressionism, Here's what criticism does, in the widest sense of the word criticism. Somebody new comes along and says, that's very interesting. Now, they've taken something that's thing-specific and says, that's very interesting. But, you know, what in the hell happened to Passario and Renoir? Because I say, and then this other guy begins to weave a tale of how close, it's not well known, how close Renoir's studio was to Monet, who sold the actual first painting. They found, or this guy says, I know of some sketches that Renoir was doing two years before Monet painted the haystacks or whatever his first one was. You understand? It's not right or wrong. It's nothing to laugh at. It is, in a sense, sometimes what we refer to as hobbies in the city. But it's more than that. It is this continuing cycle. It's not that Monet is of no interest to anybody that's got any sort of aspirations to go past remodeling. To go somewhere here and you, you can like Monet, not like Monet, you can like art. No, that's the same what we're talking about, as you know. But you have to go past the point. There's no interest, specifically, in Monet, colon, the father of Impressionism. It's a thing specific. Somebody else says, fat chance. What happened to Renoir? Maybe that'd be the name of his book. Fat chance, <laughs> dash, what happened to Renoir? <coughs> it has taken a thing specific. It was originally a process. Monet's life, his output. It has taken that process and turned it into a thing specific. The thing specific, in this case, I could be all kinds of other things. It could be Monet, from another view. Monet, the man with a 10-year unhappy love affair. Yeah. Monet, a man with a miserable marriage. Monet, a man before his time. Monet, a man with real bad hair. <laughs> it could be all sorts of things. In this case, it was Monet, the father of Impressionism. His life is now this thing specific. But if it is going to survive, which something's got to, because life has got to circulate energy, there will be someone that will fall within the realm, the real realm of criticism, that will come along and say, that's well and good. And of course, as soon as they start that and they're pointing toward anything thing specific, such as Monet, colon, the father of Impressionism, they've already revived the monster. They've already pieced it back together. They've taken a process and they say, now, that's very interesting. And I like Monet as well as the next person. But come on! You know, what do you think Renoir was? You know, a sign painter? Don't you people know anything about history? It has taken a thing specific 
and now turn it into a process. All forms of debate, all forms of criticism. In the widest sense of what criticism would be, you are sort of bringing things truly back to life <laughs> from a secondary view, not that they were dead. But once things have become, or anything, any body, any act, you know, the battle, not only Napoleon gone, and we can talk about him because you can look up his birth date and his day he died. So he, the man is now a thing specific. We don't have to deal with him. He can't move around and mess up at least his birth and you know, his lifespan because if that's on the test tomorrow, at least you can memorize it and put down the day he was born and the day he died. But if he was here, you know, it's iffy if your, question, if your response is going to be correct. You know, when was Napoleon... Give us the date of his birth and the day he died. And you really give it your best effort, and the son of a bitch is still alive. <laughs> it's going to be iffy. Now, you've got to face it. You might get the first part right. That is, his birth date. You follow me? But let's say that you know, the full question is, give his birth and death date. And so half of it's not going to get you anywhere. And that could be the key question. That could be the pivot one that would determine whether you, you know, pass your barber exam and get to practice in this state or not. <laughs> but if the man's alive, he is not truly capable of being sufficiently thingamatized. All you can do is talk about aspects of him because he's still alive. At any rate, so Napoleon could be dead, and he's a thing specific. But not only a person, you can take a whole act, a whole occurrence, it would, a processional of his final battle. Waterloo out there on the field. <laughs> the battle is now. The hours, the days that led up to it and then the final hours of it. The many, many people running here and there. The many sounds, the smells, the blood and the sweat. It is now a thing specific. It is the Battle of Waterloo. They have become, in one sense, static. They're not only past, as far as ordinary intellect's concerned, which don't close the door on any other possibility, but as far as ordinary intellect's concerned, obviously something that happened in 1815 is finished. It's over. So at least you can stick a pen in it and put it there in your little book of memories or in your history book or in your answer book. That that is something specific. There is the Battle of Waterloo. It's not a process. It is a thing specific. But through criticism, in the full sense, remember, not just criticism as practiced by people in small town newspapers, but the attempt to revise, to expand history, to expand one's artistic or a whole society, a whole institutional survey of art, of music, of history, of any field. What you are doing is taking something that had already become thing specified, something that had already become static. And in a sense, you have breathed life back into it. You, in a sense, are reliving the past. But it will then turn back, either in you or somebody else, almost simultaneously, as fast as you can do it. It will go back from being a new process or a renewed process back into a thing specific. And it can bounce back again a split second later in you and somebody else. That is, you could stand up and laugh. You could be standing there in the museum, and it says, and it's entitled, Monet, the Father of Impressionism. There are all sorts of people there, all sorts of paintings, all sorts of smells, perhaps not blood and sweat as much as on the fields of Waterloo, but there you are in the midst of a process. But then you look up, and it's Monet, colon, the father of Impressionism, and so there's a thing specified. And you look up at that, and you kind of point, and other people see you point, and you go, ha! So what do they think Renoir was? Chopped liver? And now you, and then maybe you look off the you lost interest, and you looked off somewhere else, and I was thinking, baby walked by. That's art criticism talk I picked up. <laughs> and so perhaps you went from it was a thing specific to a process, and then you forgot all about it because this, somebody walked by and said hello to you, and so it went back in your memory, and it went back to being a thing specific. But by you saying that, ha, huh, what do they think Renoir was? Then you got other people over here that might have went, God, I never thought of that. Or somebody else over there goes, who was Renoir? Or somebody says, why is that guy talking? Or somebody asks, way over here, says, what do he say? Huh? 
energy. You don't think that from certain views, if you had the right altitude and attitude, without any thing specific hostility, that everything in the secondary world is funny? Okay, humorous. You could see the whole idea of criticism, especially when it gets down, if I must, down to the level that criti critics get attacked. And like the good old ones that no ordinary critic can ever defend himself with unless he's got a good right hand, is to point out critics. Ha! Critics! <laughs> Artists do. Those who can't criticize. That a critic of anything is simply somebody that couldn't do it. Any art critic. The world's most famous critic, the man who has done the most accepted, telling, piercing, definitive work on Monet. I've heard about you, yes. Could I see some of your work? Well, yes, here's one of my books. Oh, no, 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 I didn't mean that. Could I see some of your paintings? I'm sorry, I don't paint. They've been sitting ducks for that throughout history. But what it amounts to is this kind of cycle if we want to stay here for just a second, and rather than just being, uh, give you a variation, instead of just referring to it as process of becoming things specified and then into process and things specified, what are you talking about? It's like creativity, criticism, creativity, criticism, creativity, criticism. It's what history is. It's what every book of remembered quotations, proverbs, axioms, common sense. It's all a form of creativity, and I don't mean that in any qualitative sense. It just appears that somebody did something. Somebody built a cabinet. Somebody made a clothes rack, a tire rack, and says, here, what do you think of that? Somebody said, if that's a tire rack, I'm glad I don't have a neck. <laughs> and then, then the guy running shop turns to the guy that just said that and says, you shouldn't talk about people that way. And somebody in the back says, how come Mr. So-and-so is always hanging around where we're trying to have fun? Somebody says, fun? How can you have fun taking shop? <laughs> there is no beginning, there is no end to it, except sequentially, if you want to see what's going on, it is what appears to be somebody trying to do something. I repeat one more time, it's got nothing to do with the quality of it. Forget it. Unless it's a hobby of yours. But it could be Monet to some guy with a 75 IQ attempting to make a tire rack in shop. Same thing. And they hold it up, and somebody looks at it and goes, huh, perhaps I could do my doctoral thesis on the nature, the, un, the inexplicable expansion of poorly made tire racks. Either that, or I think I'll do it on Monet. <laughs> Maybe I call it Monet the father of impressionism. It is a cycle. It, and it, but it all fits in once you begin to see it into a greater cycle, a greater description of processes dash thing specific. Dash processes dash thing specific dash processes, except it being so sequential, you've got to see that we'd be going into the infinitely adjacent. That no matter where you look, there is a nonstop adjacentment to whatever if you're looking at a thing specific in all possible directions, an omni ambiance to that thing specific are processes. And if the ordinary, to stretch for altitude, if the ordinary intellect could get in there right quick and look, that's when they would see why, for instance, they cannot answer, what, what's funny going on about the line of cause and effect? What's going on funny is there is no such thing. <laughs> Because if you saw an infinite adjacentment, then what would appear to be a cause is then an effect of something. I'm using what the ordinary intellect would call it because if you could see that, you wouldn't deal in those terms anyway. But if you, if I could stretch this kind of reality rubberly enough to get your three-dimensional mind in there, it would appear that, wait a minute, this then, right next to that, then this is a cause of that effect. Other than the fact then right beside this was something that was an effect of that cause and then over here, Okay, forget it. How about the other example I was going to use? Oh, while we're there, uh, the greater umbrella description would be into the processes, dice, things specific, dice processes. But some of you might care to note, just on your own, how this could apply to the cycle of 
men wanting to change, dash. Fail to change, dash. Still want to change, dash. Still failed, dash. I want to change again, dash. I failed again, dot, 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 dot. You don't want that by yourself? Think about it. That doesn't matter whether you take some fairly easy observation and say that, boy, it's hard to change, or to get even more aggressive and say, people don't really change, or to say, well, people do change. It doesn't matter what you say, even people who change. If you say, boy, you used to be a drunk. Yes, you're right, but now I haven't had a drink in years. Have you really changed? Well, look at me. Have I not changed? Yes. But then if you said, well, I guess in that case, you just about got your life just tied right up. Oh, heavens no. There are many other things I'd like to change. No matter what view you take, it goes into either change, the desire to change, and I was, of course, using the easy one to say, failure to change. And then, still want to change, dice. Still failed again, dice. Well, I still want to change, damn it, dice. Well, I still failed, damn it. It could be, want to change, here, did change here, dash. Want to change there, did change there. I'm pursuing now, apparently, a sequence of somebody in the three-dimensional world who is very successful, professional success person, changer. But it goes on and on. Well, I was going to give you at least one more example. Uh, in the secondary world, the establishment of verbal reality Again, it's just, uh, from one view, it's the way in which life moves energy via man's speech, serving its own purposes, as you can see, and is far beyond the grasp of the ordinary mind to say what the purpose of this is, to find the beginning and the end of what the words are doing. We got, let's go to music. We got a guy, Sal Manella, in his band. <laughs> Sal, no company would touch him. He has not made a record in 10 years. And then suddenly, a company picks him up. They get in the studio, and you pick up trade magazines or the newspaper. And here's an ad, big ad, and it says, they proclaim, Salmonella's band, Dice, first recording in a decade. In a sense, I'm going to try to twist it for you, but in a sense, they have turned a failure into a success. <laughs> Do you follow? I mean, if you first pick it up, let's say you don't know who Sal is. But you just see, and it, it's like, did I, did I make it crude enough? Maybe the ad is really big, and it says, what music lovers have been waiting for? Your perseverance paid off. Rush to your record store because it's Sal Manella's first recording in a decade. And you think, Jesus. You know, and you picture something like, although he didn't do it, uh, a Schubert writing one symphony. And then starting another one, and think, no, nah, I don't think I'll finish this one. And he goes off, and he disappears 10 years. And everybody thinks, boy, I sure would like to hear another one of those Schubert symphonies. And then you hear, all right, he did finish another one. Right? And so let's say that you had that kind of inclination already into your secondary thinking. And you see this ad, Salmonella, first recording in a decade. And you think, wow, God, I bet that's worth waiting for. Except you don't understand, for 10 years... He couldn't find a record company to give him the time of day. In other words, he made a record 10 years ago, and it was such a resounding, you know, that he tried to go in one of these little recorder booths in the bus station for a quarter, and they threw him out. For 10 years, for 10 years, nobody in the record business would spit on the man in his music. Life is full of such great examples we should hesitate to pursue any of them much further. Because they're just taking a souffle and not only trying to enjoy it, but then try to sit on it or make a trampoline out of it. 
All right, let me, let me turn it. Let me try another way. That should be enough to... Well, I hate to leave with any possibility. Do you see, this is not an attack on advertising, not an attack on music. It's not an attack on anything. And it's not a conspiracy. It is not people somewhere. I'm sure there are people in advertising. I could point this out in some certain way, and I might get them to give a good, hearty, aggressive chuckle like, ha, ha, ha. And then if I said, wait a minute, I bet you're the kind of person who would have done that, or even if I found out that they were the agents that did it, and I said, see, I'm smart enough. That's what you guys had in mind. Then as soon as they heard that, they could take the thing specific of what they'd already done and let it be a process and maybe give me a sly grin like, you're pretty sharp to catch on. Which they didn't do it. It was not a conspiracy by people. They just seemed like the right thing to do. And what are we going to do and advertise? But I want you to see on another level, it is life-moving energies that in one way appear to be, like Salmonella and his music. Let's make it a thing specific. The whole ambiance around Salmonella and his music the way he plays, whatever it is he plays, I forget now. Zither, I think, but the world's only heavy metal zitherist. But at any rate, him and the people dependent upon him, the guys that come through his band, everybody. He was dead meat. He was dead in the water. He was a thing specific that was just stable, stagnant. Ten years. That's a long time. And then somebody decides, for whatever reason, life adopts him again and tries to turn him back into a process, a living act. And the ad is, not for 10 years he was nobody, and now we've got to some way explain away why you should buy his record when for 10 years our company and every other right-thinking person in the music business thought, you know, Sal, give us a break. <laughs> but now we've got a record out and somebody's got to buy this thing. We've got money invested, and so we'll take a positive approach. Maybe nobody will notice, we'll just say, what you been waiting for? Wait no more. His first recording. What? From one view. Not the right view. Not the only view. Not only the second only view. But from one view, we have taken a failure and verbally made it a success. And it's not just advertising. That's not the point. It's life doing it. It is life turning processes into things specific, and then back into processes, and then into things specific. Let me see if I can turn it backwards, inside out, before you lose your place. That, in a sense, if you follow, if it'll help, that life has almost turned an energy that humans would call, that is, Sal's lack of a recording contract and his success for 10 years, has turned a failure into a success. That is, in the ad, and the ad's not the point, but verbally. The verbal reality is, flash, Sal Manella's first recording in a decade. Don't look at that as just an ad or some kind of hype. That is a verbal reality because they're telling the truth, and it, well, whether it's the truth or not, if you read it and you went, well, I don't know who that is, but you know, maybe I'll look into it. I mean, the kind of guy that spends 10 years kind of getting himself together, and between each record, he wants to work on it so much, and it's a decade, that, you know, that's worth looking into. As if they're not my favorite instrument, but I'll check into it. Take this. A fairly ordinary process, uh, just do it real shorthand, but the ordinary, secondary, mechanical processes of reason and memory. Kind of a, to many people, an odious, tiring process. And humanity, thanks in no small part to life, comes up with a thing specific to handle this processional problem to make it simple, let's call it the personal computer. To take away this process you know, of having to keep track of all kinds of little old mundane areas of data that take up too much of my time, I have to keep referring, well anyway, you know as much as I do, that you could look at a cure for this kind of process at a certain level. The very thing that even critics of, if there is such a thing, well, I'm sure there are critics of computers, that they will even say, well, all right, they're good for one thing. At least they can do that kind of mechanical remembering. You know, it's like an electric abacus. So I give them that much credit. Other than that, though, I think it's a communist plot by the liberals or something. <laughs> so we have had a process, mechanical automatic memory and that kind of mechanical reasoning that a computer can do. 
let's look at the computer as being the thing specific that this process was turned into at some level and that people were satisfied this will do, it will take this process of just mechanical addition and arithmetic. This kind of process now can be turned into a thing specific and we can leave that process. We can cut it right here and now this replaces the process. All right. But now look. I suggest that right now at least half of the advertising done having to do with the things specified, the process of mechanical reasoning and memory that has now become a thing specific, that is the computer. I would suggest that, let's just say half, of the advertising now done related to computers is on this basis. The ads will say, what is your, Mr. Businessman, what is your biggest computer problem? And of course, they're going to answer it for you. Dice. Employees lack of skill therewith. It's services to teach your employees that the computer is their friend. How to use a computer. That the question that they're asking now, Mr. Businessman, how many thousands of dollars did you spend installing workstations and computers in your business? That's right, a lot. And now what is your biggest problem? Not the computers. No, not with all the scientific and technological breakthrough. What is your biggest problem? Employees' inability to use them correctly and fully. That's why we're here. Do you see it has gone from a process to a thing specific? It went from a, let's call it a problem, the problem that just mechanical memory and just routine addition and reason, the kind that will fit into an off-on switch, was a problem, a bottleneck, too time-consuming, so there comes about a cure. And all cures from processes from, that seem to be problems, the cure for every processional problem is for something to be made thing specific. Well, thank God. Now, computers won't do everything, said somebody somewhere. Mr. IBM, I can't remember his first initials, but Mr. IBM, or maybe it's Mr. Xerox, says, well, at least now we can take all this kind of mechanical, you know, labor-intensive memory filing retrieval system in this process, which is labor-intensive, cost-ineffectualness is just astounding, but it has been cured now by making it a thing specific, that is, a computer. But is that the end of it? Well, if it is, you're going to hear about computers or read about them in popular science one month. And then you think, years later, what come to the laser turntable? What come to what they call those things, uh, personal commuters, computer something? They'll disappear if it is simply a cure for a problem. That is, if it is simply a erstwhile process that becomes a thing specific. And if it's seen as a cure, you forget about it. You now, how many of you remember, uh, probably most of you don't, how many remember you actually being around polio or remember when salt came up with a vaccine? Or how many of you, you're not old enough to have friends that were you know, plugged into iron lungs and were crippled and just overnight almost. They were cheering and I'm sure they gave them a parade and salt, I'm sure, won the Nobel Prize, came up with the salt vaccine and now, how often do people stand around and discuss polio? Once something is, if it's actually cured, it goes away. If the computer was going to actually be a cure for some problem, it would go away. I mean, it would it cure the problem like the vaccine stopped everybody that gets it from getting polio. And so who talks about the vaccine? What's there to talk about? They give it to you automatically, I'm sure, in most states in the United States now before you can get into school. They force you to take a shot. And I think it's 100% you know, effective. And that's the end of it. Nobody discusses it. But if it is going to continue to pass about energy, which polio was passing about some kinds of energy and life didn't like it, and it stopped it. But after you know, it stopped it, there was nothing else to say. There was no more energy to talk about. Not of any great degree, unless it's going to pop up on Jeopardy as a question or something. <laughs> so the computer, 
what I was getting, I wanted you to see this kind of turns inside out, that it literally, let's just take it, certain so-called problems that were not cost-effective to have humans sitting around having to do all this filing, that now, thanks to the silicone chip and other stuff, that somebody can sit there and go, boom, and in split seconds do what used to take X amount of man hours to do. And so this problem that's been identified, there was a processional problem, was cured by making the problem into something thing specific, in this case, the computer. So you think, well, at least in this area, that problem is solved. If it was, you wouldn't know, most of you would, wouldn't have any more recollection of the personal computer than you would the salt vaccine. It would have been forgotten about. But it's not. It is not a cure. Because now the cure has produced its own problem. The ad, Mr. Businessman, look at the money you spent. Good money on good computers. No problem with a computer. They're there, they shine, they plug in, they hum, they put off a warm glow. So what's the problem? You know you got problems. Everybody, yeah, yeah. What is the problem? <laughs> the problem is putting them to proper use. Yeah. Well, that's our service. That is, we got a process. We'll come in because you've got the thing to cure it, right? Yeah, I bought it. It's a computer. What you need is for people to know how to operate it. Yeah, I thought they did, but it just hadn't worked out. Well, you've got to turn the thing specific into a new process. And part of the process is, come pay us, we're a professional. That is, we're a service. We don't deal in goods. We don't sell computers. We're not trying to push a computer. We're not saying anything's wrong with your computers. That is, your thing specific. I bet you've got real good computers, Mr. Businessman. We can tell you've got good taste. I can look at that tie you're wearing. So I bet you've got real good computers. It's so we're not trying to sell computers, that is goods, that is things specific. We're here selling services, that is processes. But the process, you could not be selling a process uh, to teach employees how to better use computers unless there was a computer to start with, right? Right. In other words, you could not be curing this problem unless the problem was already there, right? The computer, which was originally what? A cure for a problem. <laughs> ah. <laughs> See, only a few people care to think about such things, <laughs> assuming that they can. All right, what I want you to see vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what we mentioned about Salmonello's first album in a decade, and of turning a failure into a success, can you see now that in this case, the computer, you're turning a success into a failure? <laughs> Back to the ad. Start, let's jump in the middle there. You hear on the radio, there you sit, you're Mr. Businessman or Mrs. Businessman. And it says, Mr. Businessman, did you spend good money filling up your offices and wiring up everything with good computers? And you went, yes. No, it's success. Do you get the good kind? Yes, I did. Did you buy the best available? Yes, I did. You spared no expense. That's right. So, and the computers you do know will fulfill the function that you bought them for. Well, I'm convinced of that. Success. So what is your problem, Mr. Businessman? Uh, uh, as you keep waiting, it says, yes, we know. It's the employee's inability to make full use of it. You're right. They have been able to snatch, I guess you would say, failure from the jaws of success. <laughs> In other words, you got a computer which was a cure, a successful thingamization of a process. You paid for it, they're paid for it, they sit there, they're shiny, you keep them clean, yes, yes, yes. But <laughs> it's a failure. You're right. Because we've got to take this thing specific and rejuvenate it. We've got to turn it back into a process. It is always, to say it point blank, that we just rushed past a few minutes ago, a problem process, whatever it is, and it's not our judgment, it's just anything in life, all the way from I waste too much time in my office having people having to keep going back to the filing cabinet and checking stuff. Or whether we, if it's a record company, we keep signing up too many of these artists that are has-beens. We keep them, you know, drop everybody's contract. Whatever it is, there's some kind of process in life. Your love affair, your marriage. Did the process has become a problem? Or you wouldn't be alive. So you can look at it as all problem processes if they seem to even come to an episodic conclusion. A reasonable treatment, like a divorce, or hey, drop Salmonella and his like from the roster and let them sue us. I don't care how long their contract, drop everybody. We're going to get a whole new 
group of acts here. A problem process becomes, let us say, from the lines we were taking, they become a thing specific which immediately at some level of the people involved, those transferring that kind of energy, the thing specific appears to be a cure. It's just what we've been looking for, a new artist, just what we've been looking for, a computer, a machine to do all of this labor intensive and cost intensive labor, we now have a cure for it, this machine. The cure will always produce new problems. I'm using just from their view. They might not want to call it that. The thing specific that was derived from a process will then become its own problem. And if it's going to stay alive and be remembered, it will then become a new kind of process. Then it will become a thing specific again. Then it will become a process again. It is always an attempt to cure the cure, is what they're dealing with. <laughs> but at the secondary level, the cure of all problems, which start out, just you have to jump in, but all problems appear to be, if you try to look at it, just past where you are, toward its background. It's always a process. You don't just open the door and like a foundling left on your door that, you know, a businessman opens up the door, or a husband or wife, and there is a divorce in a basket. <laughs> or there is employee inefficiency in a cardboard box crying. Mama, mama. <laughs> now, if it seemed, whatever the problem seems to be, it was a process that got it to you. You didn't just open the door and the, the problem was there, thingamatized. It was not a thing specific. It presents itself to you, and you have to find a make the thing specific to even identify as a problem. But it had a paper trail, it had a verbal trail, it had a history, and it was a process that brought it here. And what appears to be the cure, nobody analyzes it or thinks about it this way, but the apparent cure, the attempted treatment by making it fast cure, is this process gets here, and this immediately becomes, to, to be a problem, it becomes a thing specific. Simply by you saying, we got a problem. It's a thing specific then, or you couldn't even call it a problem. It is always, apparently, the cure. The reasonable treatment right there is to apply this in such a way or your attention to it that the thing specific turns back into a process. But it will inevitably, very quickly, may take a little while, the renewed process itself produces its own, quote, problems. And then the only way to deal with that is it has to be turned into something specific again. The process has to be turned into a thing specific. We're out of time. I will point out for tonight, it is simply self-fueling at its finest. Phew.